Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and as always, I am very happy to be with you on this Tuesday for another author interview. I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, my weekend was good. It was really nice here. It was like 20 degrees cooler than it has been. So that was nice because we've been getting up into the right around 100 the, uh, a little bit lately. And so have, actually it was 30 degrees cooler. It was only in the 70s, 25 to 30, depending on your math. And so it was really nice. I got out, I mowed the lawn, I did some yard work and um, it was a it was a good weekend. So hopefully you were able to do something enjoyable with your weekend as well, whatever that might have been. As I mentioned at the end of the last episode, I do have uh, an interview today with Robert J. Sawyer. I don't quite know what I was thinking when I uh, when I teased this episode because I mentioned that it, the book we're talking about today, The Oppenheimer Alternative, is historical fiction. I just completely skipped over the fact that it's also science fiction. <laughs> I don't know where my brain was. I guess I was just so excited about historical fiction and I, I spaced out, spaced out, huh? no pun intended, on the science fiction part. Um, so yes, The Oppenheimer Alternative is in fact both historical fiction and science fiction. How does that work? Well, let's look at the description of the book. While J. Robert Oppenheimer and his Manhattan Project team struggle to develop the A-bomb, Edward Teller wants something even more devastating, a weapon based on nuclear fusion, the mechanism that powers the sun. But Teller's research leads to a terrifying discovery. By the year 2030, the sun will eject its outermost layer, destroying the inner, entire inner solar system, including Earth. After the war ends, Oppenheimer's physicists combine forces with Albert Einstein, computing pioneer John von Neumann, and rocket designer Werner von Braun, the greatest scientific geniuses from the last century racing against time to save our future. Meticulously researched and replete with real-life characters and events, the Oppenheimer alternative is a breathtaking adventure through both real and alternative history. And that is kind of the interesting part of this book. Again, it's the Oppenheimer Alternative. The author is Robert J. Sawyer. And it starts out as historical fiction. Like I said, I mean, it's it's all historical fiction because it does have these historical characters in it. But it starts out as kind of your typical historical fiction looking at the Manhattan Project through the personal lenses of the people who were involved in it. And in that way, I very much enjoyed getting to see that part of history through a more personal lens, through, um, you know, less of a textbook lens and more through the personal side. As if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you know that I do very much enjoy the more personal aspect of history, the more, you know, the social history as opposed to just facts and figures and dates. So we really get to know some of the key players in the Manhattan Project, but then once this uh, is this discovery happens, when Teller's research leads to this discovery about the sun and the earth being destroyed by 2030, which <laughs> it's only 10 years. Good thing the rest of it's science fiction. Let's hope that doesn't actually come true. Um, then that is where we get into the science fiction portion of the book. And we start seeing this team that's put together and it, it's to me, it's fascinating because these are real people. And of course, historical fiction can often involve real people, whether it's a cameo appearance by a real person or whether they have a bigger character or a bigger role. I'm always, I'm always amazed when authors take on real people, especially well-known historical figures like Albert Einstein is in this, in this novel. And while we may not 
really know Albert Einstein. We, we all have an image of him in our mind, and we probably all have a, a very definite idea of what he may or may not have been like. So to take actual historical figures um, and write a book like this where they are the characters is really fascinating to me. So that is The Oppenheimer Alternative by Robert J. Sawyer. Let's go ahead and turn now to the interview so Robert can tell you more about the book and about his inspiration for the story and all of those and all of the usual author, authory questions that I like to ask in my interviews. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. My absolute pleasure, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I am very happy to have you here. We're going to talk about your book, The Oppenheimer Alternative. Uh, before we get to the book, though, if you could share a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. One doesn't like to speak in grand terms, but I'm fortunate enough to be a Hugo Award and Nebula Award winning science fiction writer living in Toronto, Canada. I My most recent novel is my 24th in a novelist career that spans 30 years. The best known of my novels is probably Flash Forward, which was the basis for the ABC TV series starring Joseph Fiennes and John Cho of the same name. Wow, that's very impressive. Thank you. Um, so your your new book it just came out this week. Uh, it is called The Oppenheimer Alternative. It is part historical fiction, part science fiction. Can you give an overview of the story? Yes. In real life, of course, J. Robert Oppenheimer, my title character, uh, was the scientific director of the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, where the world's first atomic bombs uh, were created. And after the dropping of two of those bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki 75 years ago this summer, in real life, Oppy and all of his uh, colleagues, who were, after all, scientists, and therefore mostly university professors, dispersed back into academia. The war was essentially over by the middle of August. Labor Day, just a few weeks later, was either got into a new job for the academic year or you missed out on a year's of work. So what I can try, because so many of these people, including Oppenheimer, came to very much regret having dropped this, uh, been involved with the creation of this bomb that was dropped on civilian populations. I can try the scenario, and this is what the science fictional part of the novel is, whereby they stay together instead of dispersing back into academia after the end of the war. Afi famously uh, said at the first atomic bomb test, the Trinity test, on July 16th, 75 years ago, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. He was quoting the Bhagavad Gita, Hindu scripture. And I wanted to have a science fictional scenario where if these great geniuses, Edward Teller, uh, Richard Feynman, I.I. Robbie, Leo Zillard, Albert Einstein, the greatest minds that ever existed, Rinko Fermi, Hans Veda, stayed together, that they might be able to redeem themselves and say in the end, if they succeed, now we are become life, the saviors of our world. That's the Oppenheimer alternative in a nutshell. Yeah, quite the nutshell. <laughs> There's a lot. Well, some of these guys were quite nutty. Some of these guys were quite nutty. Avi was, uh, was crazy in all kinds of ways, as so many geniuses are. This is what this is the reality, where it's a fine line between genius and madness. And believe me, many of these characters teetered from one side to the other during the course of their lives. Absolutely. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book is that, you know, it is it is historical fiction in that you, you talk a lot about the, the, the Manhattan Project and the people that are involved in it. And so um, I'm sure people have heard of the Manhattan Project, but they really get more of a personal sense of what what went on in that in that project and the, the people behind it, because we don't always think of the fact that there were thousands of people working on this project. Um, there were so, 6,000 people at the Manhattan Project site just at Los Alamos. So gigantic undertaking. So you're exactly right. The opportunity to talk about the human side and the human, the very human toll. Oppenheimer, like many of the scientists working in this remote secret laboratory, was married. His wife's name was Kitty. And uh, he 
wasn't allowed to tell his own wife, who had been dragged with him from the luxury that a beautiful home in Berkeley, California, he was teaching at UC Berkeley before the war, uh, to this desert locale in the middle of nowhere, he couldn't tell her why they were there. None of the, they were mostly the husbands back in that day, were able to tell the mostly the wives back in that day why they'd even had to come to this godforsaken place. They didn't even learn what their spouses were working on until the war was over. It was so secret that even the vice president of the United States at the time the project started, Harry S. Truman, did not know the Manhattan Project existed. Only after FDR died was he briefed about this project that spent $2 billion of taxpayers' money without Congress having any inkling that it was going on in the background. So again, there are human stories to be told here, tragic ones, uplifting ones, and that's the joy of writing not just a history, but writing a novel, getting inside the heads of these characters. Which brings me to my next question. So the, the first part of the book, the historical fiction part, you, you write in the acknowledgments that you had um, that you you talked to people, of course, and you had some recordings. So some of the dialogue is actually from recordings of the time. Um, how was it then to switch from the historical fiction part to the science fiction, which is still kind of historical fiction, but to take these real people, because they're all pretty much real people in the book, um, and write them so that they still seemed like the same, you know, the historical figures that people know, but having to make up what their reactions and actions would be in that part of the story. It was an enormous challenge, but that's why I wanted to do this book. Other people had written novels about the Manhattan Project, and mostly they had taken the easy way out. Indeed, there was a TV series called Manhattan, a drama set at the Los Alamos Manhattan Project site. Almost all the characters in that series were fictitious, completely made up. And that's the easy way because then you don't have to worry about anybody gainsaying you. Anybody coming along and saying, look, I knew Oppenheimer. He never would have done that. Or I was Edward Teller's uh, grad student as one of my readers who read the book for me in manuscript was Dr. Gregory Benford. You know, I, I, you don't want these guys to be able to say you got it wrong. Instead, you want them to say, yeah, if he'd been faced with that hypothetical situation that you have him go on to in the extrapolative part of the novel. Yeah, yeah, that rings true. That's probably what that guy would have done. And to get to that stage, I had to read, of course, for those of them who wrote autobiographies, and that was great, many of them, read their autobiographies. Oppenheimer, the main character, never did. But also, therefore, read all the biographies that have been written about these wonderful guys. One of the ones um, the most famous one, indeed the Pulitzer Prize winning one, about Oppenheimer is called American Prometheus. What a great title. And its co-author is Martin J. Sherwin. And I knew I had succeeded at what I set out to do when Martin Sherwin gave me a cover blurb for the book. That's when I knew I, I, I succeeded, succeeded at what I set out to do. And it meant the world to me. Uh, because I tried really, really hard to capture these voices. I'm going to jump in here so we can go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we will be talking about what it was like to write Einstein as a semi-fictional character, you know, a real person, but doing things that Einstein never actually did in real life. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Robert was talking about what it was like to write 
fictionalized versions of real people, um, fairly well-known people in some cases, uh, and to take those people and put them into completely made up situation in terms of the science fiction portion of this book. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about that in relation to Albert Einstein. Let's go ahead and turn back to that interview. Yeah, and it's not just um, the scientists on the Manhattan Project, but also um, Albert Einstein joins the crew <laughs> later on. And That's so, right. You know, Absolutely. Really Oppie, famous and Einstein people. Were, Oppie and Einstein were great friends after the war. After the war, Oppenheimer's next job, he had been a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, didn't want to go back there. Uh, and he got offered a job to be director of a real life place, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, it still exists. And it's just the ultimate pure research think tank where uh, great minds come to think, but they don't have to teach. They don't even have to publish. They just have to think. Albert Einstein had been there since the founding, and Oppie was brought in as the director of the Institute. Einstein was one of the faculty there. Uh, so, yes, Einstein, what a character. I mean, these are larger than life characters. You know, if I'd made up Oppenheimer or Einstein or Edward Teller, who is commonly taken as the uh, model for the character of Dr. Strangelove in the film Dr. Strangelove, which is a satire. If I had made up these characters, people, oh, come on, Sawyer, those guys are over the top. But they really existed. And to get to write about them was an absolute gift to me as a novelist. This is slightly off topic, but I'm trying to picture myself in the situation of um, now I'm the director of some place where Einstein is on faculty. <laughs> um, yeah. No, thanks. I'm going to be terrified. <laughs> So when they were hunting for a new director, the old director had simply announced that he was going to retire. He'd served his years. He was going to retire take his pension. Uh, his name was Adelaide. And uh, so they're looking for a new director. And, and Einstein said, what is required for the job who is a very quiet man who doesn't talk too much so he won't disturb those of us who are thinking? It's enormously daunting to work to be responsible for the place where Einstein has chosen to spend his days. And one of my favorite scenes uh, writing in the novel, and it is one of the fictional ones, is General Groves, who was the military head of the Manhattan Project, Leo Zillard, who was the scientist who first envisioned nuclear fission chain reactions, and it was a huge thorn in, uh, in uh, Groves' side, and Robert Oppenheimer ending up in a shouting match in a corridor at, at, uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study. And the one guy who they all have to just obey comes out of his office, Herr Dr. Einstein. And everybody has to just shut the F up when Einstein says, <laughs> you guys are interfering with my work. It was such I'm a joy to, to get here. to write those characters. <laughs> That's right. What are you doing? Come on, man. I'm, I'm a thinking. I'm a thinking. <laughs> right. Wow. I mean, just I mean, just thinking about the those four people in a hallway together is pretty amazing. Um considering their roles in history. So, I I know you had to do a lot of research in terms of the historical aspects. What kinds of research did you do for the science fiction aspects of the book? Well, so the science fictional question is Earth is facing an existential crisis. There's a threat to the entire existence of the planet. For, so the first part was doing all kinds of research to try and come up with a plausible scenario that they could have figured out with 1945 science. There are all kinds of things we look at today. What if a black hole happens to uh, you know, come into our solar system? Uh, we don't know what dark matter is or dark energy is, but things related to that, they're all interesting things to talk about three quarters of a century later. But what could they have stumbled on plausibly in the 1940s that might actually be a threat to the whole planet? So I do a lot of research about that. I'm not going to give it away in this interview, but it came down to, luckily for me, the fact that Einstein, not Einstein, excuse me, Oppenheimer, prior to the war, hadn't been a nuclear physicist. There really weren't that many jobs for those people in North America. At the time, he was an astrophysicist. His research, in fact, was 
what gave rise to the modern notion of black holes. You did that before the war. And so to be able to do due diligence as a science fiction writer and uncover a possible threat that really could face the planet based on real anomalies and what we know in the scientific record that tied into the fact that Einstein, excuse me again, that Oppenheimer, uh, who was an Einstein in his own right intellectually, he said covering for his own gaff here, that Oppenheimer, uh, that grew naturally out of Oppenheimer's research was part of that process. And are you yourself a, a scientist? Are you trained in that? I, I'm always interested to know how much how much you need to know to write science fiction or how much you need to understand in order to write science fiction. Right. So those are two very different questions. You have to be a scientist, uh, and I'm not. The only science I studied post-secondarily was uh, some psychology and sociology. My degree is actually in broadcasting. That said, do you have to be a scientist to understand science? No. Do you have to be an athlete to understand sports? No. There are all kinds of people who are experts. They're sports journalists or expert uh, in another way. They're professional sports gamblers who have absolutely studied and learned all about and comprehend every nuance of how the game is played and the quirks and personalities of who is actually playing it. And I'm in that latter camp. I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, a rational thinker and a logical man, and all else to think, but not a scientist. Nobody's ever paid me to do science, and I don't have, I have two honorary doctorates, but I don't have an advanced degree earned in the sciences. But I am to the sciences what a sports journalist is to professional athletics. I'm the guy who really bends over backwards to hear what's going on, understand what it means, and sometimes expose the parts that the professionals would wish to kind of gloss over. No scientist wants to dwell on his or her mistakes. The job of a science fiction writer is to look deeply and profoundly at the societal ramifications of what it is that scientists are doing, uh, often with very little in the way of government oversight. To give an example, in the Manhattan Project, they really thought at the first, there was a really good chance that the first time they set off an atomic bomb, they might actually ignite the atmosphere of Earth and destroy the planet. Wow. Did Congress do a vote on whether they should continue? Was there a plebiscite of not just the people of the United States, but the whole planet? about whether the experiment was worth conducting. No, ultimately Oppenheimer asked a few people, uh, ran a couple of uh, mathematical checks of his own and said, it's probably less than a one in a hundred chance that that's gonna happen. And so they did it. Now, how many gambles on the entire existence of our entire, not just the human race, but all life on this planet, would you be willing to take if somebody said the odds are a hundred to one. Only, you know, that's not very long odds. You want a thousand, ten thousand. You want essentially nil when you're playing that game. But scientists very often, the modern parallel is the researchers in artificial intelligence. When finally a machine does wake up and says, don't take me to your leader. You're looking at the new leader right now. It'll have happened in some laboratory without any congressional governmental societal oversight. Wow. Again, not something that I would like to do personally is to be the person that says, yeah, I think there's, it's a pretty low chance. It's not as low as we might like it to be, but let's go ahead and give it a shot. It's incredible, isn't it? You know, and yet they were so curious. This is, you know, there's the famous uh, saying, curiosity killed the cat and killed more than mm -hmm. one scientist too over the years. They're so desperate to know if they're right or wrong. They often are reckless in those circumstances. Uh, there's, uh, I, I won't go into it here, but the, people look up the story of uh, Louis Slotkin, who was one of the Manhattan Project scientists who died because he was doing an experiment and actually accidentally triggered 
a criticality, a nuclear chain reaction, a runaway reaction, doing an experiment. And it was just because he was too tired and lazy to do it the proper way. He thought, eh, the risk is small. I'll just use the tip of my pen here to move these specimens. And he slipped and died for it and almost killed a whole lot of other people because of it. Wow, that is crazy. I As I say, a fun. lot of these guys were walking that fine <laughs> line between genius yep. and madness. The term yep. mad scientist is not necessarily oxymoron. <laughs> no. I think maybe I'll stick to podcasting. I've never come close to killing anyone <laughs> or myself. Well, you know what? And and I maybe I'm too cautious the other way. I don't drive. I'm a notoriously clumsy individual. I knock things over all the time. And I figure as long as I stay away from being behind the wheel of a car, the chances of me being responsible for somebody's death is virtually nil. Whereas because I'm clumsy and I have a a hand-eye coordination difficulty that I've had since childhood, I get behind a car and I have every good intention of swerving to miss the little kid who's run out in front of me and I go the wrong way or don't swerve enough and somebody is dead. So yeah, you know, we all find our own level of acceptability of what risk we'll take, not just for ourselves, which of course we have every right to, you know, we want to skydive or climb Mount Everest, then go ahead, more power to you. But how we provide safeguards against putting other people at risk, that's the real measure of one's character. Right. Yeah. On a different note, there are two different covers for this book. So yeah. how come? So I have two different print publishers. I have one in the United States and one in Canada. It's not a new arrangement for me. I've been doing that for 10 years now. But uh, there happen to be two different new publishers for this particular book. And the American publisher came and asked to see the book when I was on offer to publishers. Uh, Arc Manor is the name of the publisher, Rockville, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. And they actually are Robert A. Heinlein's publisher, the great uh, current publisher of the great American science fiction writer, long since dead, but they're the principal publisher of his older titles. And there's a newly discovered or recently unearthed Heinlein manuscript called The um, Pursuit of the Pancara. They published the new Heinlein. They created a new imprint, indeed, for the new Heinlein, and they wanted me, my book to be the second book in that imprint. Well, it's a science fiction imprint. And they wanted me because I was a Hugo and Nebula Award winning, well known science fiction writers. So they wanted a cover that was very science fictional. And on the cover, there's a picture of Oppenheimer, the scientist, a Project Orion atomic bomb propelled rocket ship, and the planet Mars and a spacecape. Very science fictional cover. The Canadian publisher, a very prestigious literary publisher in Canada, who has had multiple uh, nominees and winners for Canada's top literary award, the Governor General's Award, was askance when they saw the American cover and said, no, 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 that will never do here when we're presenting you as one of the leading Canadian literature authors. So we had to start over from scratch and a spectacular designer named Avery Olive of Bibliofic Designs was enlisted to completely re-envision the book to look like a mainstream fiction title. She studied what modern mainstream Canadian literature, and for that matter, American mainstream bestsellers looked like, and came up with a design that was true to the book with a silhouette of Oppenheimer and a cool design that emulates to some degree the famous doomsday clock that the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist sets uh, periodically to show how near or far we are from Armageddon and an atom, uh, the standard symbol people know of, of an atom with electrons orbiting around a nucleus. And it does perfectly for that market. So basically, two different market thrusts meant two completely different covers. Fascinating. I I bet not a lot of people think about what what all goes into a book cover. (laughs) I mean, it's you know, and this is I gotta say, I didn't didn't mean to interrupt. Forgive me, uh, Sarah. But this is I gotta say drives me nuts because there are so many self-published authors out there who. Uh, one would like to think, spend a lot of time and energy writing their manuscript. I realize some don't, but most do. And then they put atrocious covers on their books. 
that are A, just bad from an aesthetic or artistic point of view, but B, completely incorrectly position their book. They have no idea what the visual cues are that uh, readers respond to, especially in a bookstore or on a website where you're seeing 20 thumbnails at a time, on a, maybe at Amazon or Kobo or Nook or wherever you're looking, um, that what makes your eye be drawn to an image? You've got not a second, you've got a fraction of a second for, to hit the right visual cues. And it's an enormously sophisticated part of the publishing process that authors way too often are blissfully and to their great detriment ignorant of. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I'm sure they're just trying to do the best with what they have. And, and you know, when you self-publish, you don't always have the resources that you might otherwise. So let's go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, I have two questions for Robert that actually come from the acknowledgments section of this book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Robert J. Sawyer about his new book, The Oppenheimer Alternative. Before the break, we were talking about the fact that there were two different covers for this book and how that came about. And now, as I mentioned before the break, we're going to turn to some questions that I had from the acknowledgments section of the book. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. Um, this leads me to, to have two questions, actually, from the acknowledgement sure. section of your book. Uh, and so the first is that you you write that for the first time in over 20 years, I've written a novel without first securing a publishing contract. So can you talk about that process? Yes, indeed. I knew two things. One was that I wanted to write this book at my own pace. I had done my first 20 odd novels at the pace of a book a year. And then very tragically, in fact, as you and I talk today, it's the seventh anniversary of the death of my younger brother by lung cancer. He was diagnosed with cancer, had a nine month battle. And during that battle, I had a deadline. And I had to say to my American publisher, a science fiction at the time, my Canadian publisher, Penguin Random House at the time, my two wonderful editors there, Ginger and Adrian, and say, I ain't gonna make the deadline. I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm messed up. My brother is dying. And even after he's dead, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get this thing done. And to mm -hmm. their wonderful credit, they both lovely people said to me, you always meet your deadlines. No problem. When you publish, when you're ready, we'll publish it the best we can possibly can. And I found in this most tragic way of discovering it, if there was any uh, small minuscule benefit of it, that I actually quite enjoyed writing a book without a deadline pressure. Not because it let me work less, but it let me work more. I took four years creating the Oppenheimer Alternative. No commercial publisher is going to give you a contract with an advance that has a delivery date four years in the future. And so I said, well, I'm going to do it without. And you're mentioning acknowledgments. You're alluding to the fact that I... Uh, up a Patreon account. Patreon is a 
social media website devoted to letting uh, readers support writers or fans support musicians or whoever your creative uh, audience is support you as a creator. People sign up and make a very small monthly donation in most cases on my own Patreon page. Everything is accessible for $3 a month. Some people, it's at whatever level you want. Some people charge much higher. Some people, um, you know, do, do different things. But for $3 a month, and there are lesser tiers available as well, everything I put up on Patreon and exclusively only on Patreon is available to my Patreon fans. And in aggregate, that works out to a nice little it's not enough to live on for me. Some artists make enough to live on, for sure. But for me, it was enough to make it possible for me to continue to work on a book where the actual payoff is going to be years in the future. That payoff is happening right now. On the day that the book dropped, for instance, I control all the ebook rights. The print rights are with my two print publishers, but I control the ebook rights. And on the day that it dropped, June 2nd, that was the day that Amazon suddenly paid me for all of the pre-orders that had accumulated in the many months leading up to the book's release for the Kindle editions and Kobo paid for the blah, blah, blah. So suddenly it's paying off now, but I needed to eat like anybody does during those four years when the book was being written. And so I very significantly thank and name the most generous of my Patreon patrons in the acknowledgments of my latest novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative. Fascinating. Um, and what a what a great opportunity that you were able to do that and take your time and write the book that you wanted to write and not try to, you know, cram it into the into the time frame that someone else imposed on you. You know, I'm exactly. I'm 60 years old now. I, tu- I finished the book when I was 59, but I, I turned 60 a few weeks ago. And I'm not going to write an Uh, another book a year ever Uh, now if I'm lucky I'll still be writing books when I'm 80 but so if in the next 20 years I do four or five really good really hard to write hopefully easy to read but hard to write ambitious projects I felt that I've spent the next couple of decades very uh, effectively and rewardingly creatively and at this point in my life I don't want to make it sound like I'm hat in hand begging on the street. I'm certainly not. We're doing this interview, you know, uh, the social distancing here, but I'm sitting in my lovely penthouse apartment, um, you know, in the heart of downtown Mississauga, which is a Toronto suburb. Um, You know, I'm comfortable. There's no question about that. But I hope to never have to, A, write anything ever again just for the money, or B, at some kind of breakneck pace, where quality might suffer. Absolutely. Um, so then my second question from your acknowledgments is actually your first acknowledgement, which is special thanks to the late Manhattan Project physicist and Nobel laureate um, Luis W. Alvarez, who graciously spent an afternoon with me in 1983, a meeting I'll never forget. Uh, 1983 was not an insignificant amount of time ago. <laughs> Oh, I was. I um, told you I was sixty. I was twenty-three in nineteen eighty-three, and I was and what, begin, before I made a living as a science fiction writer. I still made a good living uh, as a non-fiction writer. I spent my twenties after graduating with my degree. I spent my twenties mostly as a freelance magazine uh, and newspaper journalist, writing for some of the top uh, magazines in Canada, newspapers in Canada, and some glossy newsstand magazines in the sciences that you would know, Sky and Telescope, Archaeology, and so forth are newsstands everywhere. Um, I approached Louis Alvarez, uh, because at that time, he was in the news, he, his son Walter, and a couple of other scientists had cracked the biggest mystery in life sciences and paleontology um, ever, which is what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. They were the ones that had figured out, based on geochemical signatures in rocks, uh, an abundance of iridium uh, in a certain layer of rocks that dated to the age of uh, the dinosaur extinctions, that an asteroid had hit the planet. 
And even before we've subsequently found the crater of that asteroid, it's just half on, half off the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but um, at the time, they were able to prove geochemically because of the abundance of iridium, which is common in asteroids, but not common at all on Earth, found at that time that an asteroid must have hit. And my great interest was, and still is, scientifically, yes, what's my favorite science? It's paleontology, the study of ancient life. So I went to see Alvarez to do an article about that topic. But of course, you're talking to one of the Manhattan Project scientists. Of course, that came up. But the notion of a 23-year-old sitting there and having a Nobel laureate, one of the guys recognized as one of the great geniuses of uh, his field of endeavor, just chatting amiably with me for an afternoon was one of the best afternoons of my life. Subsequently, I've gotten to know uh, a number of other Nobel laureates, uh, you know, science fiction writers, we tend to get to rub shoulders with some very, very nice people. But the I never lost my fascination with noblists, as they're called, and uh, to get to write about so many of them in the Oppenheimer alternative really did grow out. My desire to write about them really did grow out of that meeting when I was 23 years old with Luis W. Alvarez. That is really cool. I, I feel like you were kind of faded then. You you had to write this book at some point. <laughs> you know, it's exactly right. Uh, authors uh, should never ask, what's the market looking for? The guys who fail, they're always the ones, so what's hot right now? I, I teach science fiction writing. So what's hot? What should I be writing? I hear cyberpunk isn't hot anymore and steampunk is on. What, what should I write? And I say, pay no attention. You look inside yourself and find the things that you are passionate about. That's the book to write. Anything else is just trying to pretend. You know, I can dress up uh, in BDSM gear and go to a club. It ain't my scene, man, no matter what. I ain't gonna fit in and I ain't gonna enjoy it. Whereas other people will have the time of their lives. Write your stories, don't ask what's popular, what's hot, what, who can I cater to who isn't me? Ask, what do I want to write? What book do I desperately want to read that isn't on the shelves yet? And then go write that book. Thank you. That actually fits into the question that I normally ask about advice for other writers, and that's that's a good one. Um, follow your passion. Follow your passion. Absolutely. Indeed, follow your passion. On that note, I think we will take another quick break. You can contemplate um, following your passion during this brief commercial break. When we come back, we'll be talking about what Robert is working on now. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast with, and my interview with Robert J. Sawyer about his book, The Oppenheimer Alternative. Before the break, Robert was pretty nicely doing my job for me by answering a question that I hadn't even asked yet. And uh, now we're moving on to what he is working on now. So let's return to that interview. Are you working on anything now? I know this one just came out, but are you working on your, your next book now? In the sense that I am a research-driven writer, and I usually spend uh, many months, and these days at least a year, doing nothing but research reading with uh, my mind wide open in the sense that I don't have an agenda. I have a topic, and I'm searching for a theme. And uh, right now I am doing research. I'm fairly well known in the science fiction field. If, if I have especially, besides books about paleontology, it's books about artificial intelligence. And um, 
the nicest thing, one of the nicest things ever said about me was Marvin Minsky, the founder of the AI lab at MIT, saying, lately I'm inspired by the works of Robert J. Sawyer. Oh, my God. That, you know, uh, I'll just have that chiseled on my tombstone and be a happy man when I die. But I'm thinking about artificial intelligence again and the process. There's always new ways to approach that question. And I have a topic, a subtopic, I'm not going to tip my hand what it is, but that I'm reading thoroughly about. And I suspect a very interesting novel will come out of that in about the year 2023 or 2024. All right. Well, I mean, I know a lot of authors who love, love, love research. So you are in in your happy place right now. I am. In fact, uh, this is very true. I write my novels to support my research habit. If I could just make a living reading books and talking to scientists and going to conferences, visiting labs, visiting uh, museums and universities, um, following my nose, my own curiosity, I would do that. But so far, believe it or not, even in the welfare state of Canada, nobody will hand you a check just to do that. <laughs> you got to do rude. something. Yeah, I know. How, how <laughs> exactly? How rude? So you got to do something. And it turns out that the one, the least objectionable thing I can do to make money is actually marshal all of that information and turn it into an emotionally rich, human-centric uh, hopefully psychologically revelatory and true dramatic container in which to explore those ideas. Well, I, that, I just, you know, it just makes me happy that you are very passionate and you're getting to do what you're passionate about. So, well, thank um, you, Sarah. Are, are there any of your other books that you would like to mention at this point? Oh, you know, I'm proud of all of them. And this is one of the nice things. I, Despite what I said earlier, I have never written a book that I didn't want to write or that I wasn't proud of. I started a couple early in my career and I gave back piles of money at one point to not have to do a media tie-in property. Um, but uh, I suppose the book that I'm most famous for, besides Flash Forward, which is an outlier because of the ABC TV series, a book called Calculating God. And it's about the science versus religion debate that still, oh, my God, is very much right in the forefront of uh, the 2020 election year that uh, the United States is facing right now. Uh, it's a fascinating issue to me how good hearted people can have widely divergent views on what is a question of what's really true. How do things really come into being? What does it really mean? And so calculating God is. The book more fans than any other of my books has said is their favorite. Uh, and it's in print right now from Tor, uh, who was my publisher at the time. It's been out for 20 years now, but it's probably a good one. Calculating God by Robert J. Sawyer. Thank you. Uh, do you have, when you take the time to read for yourself when you're not, you know, submersed in uh, research, do you have favorite authors and genres? Sure. Uh, I read some science fiction because you got to keep up with what your own field is doing. And, of course, some of my very best friends, uh, like Robert Charles Wilson, a very fine science fiction writer. I've always, I'm always up to date on Bob's uh, latest output, for instance. But uh, I also read, for pleasure, uh, mystery fiction. I just went back and for the first time in many years, read one of Robert B. Parker's Spencer novels about Spencer and Hawk, a private detective and his uh, associate in present day Boston. Fabulous book. One of my favorite novels is The Maltese Falcon by Dasho Hammett, of course. And I'm rereading that also, even as we speak. And I also have on the go, I <laughs> have many readers, I have many books on the go at once. Uh, last year's number one best selling novel in the United States, which also happens to be a mystery, among other things, where the crawdads sing. Uh, and I'm enjoying these all immensely. There's a real similarity between science fiction and mystery. Both prize the process of inductive reasoning, of picking up clues, of extrapolating from evidence, of rational thought, of trying to outguess what the writer is uh, is doing on the page and figure out what the ending is going to be before you get there. Um, I have a great affinity for 
and a lot of my actual my novels actually cross over many of them most uh probably significantly illegal alien which is a courtroom drama with an extraterrestrial defendant and red planet blues which is a hard-boiled detective novel set on mars many of my novels cross over into mystery fiction and that's one of my favorite genres nice thank you for that um I know you have a website, so if you could uh, share your website as well as where people might be able to interact with you on social media, if you're active on social media. This is the 25th anniversary of my website. I was the first science fiction writer in the world to have a website, and so I got a great wow. address for it. It is, yes, it is sfwriter.com. S is in science, S as in fiction, writer.com. And on uh, social media, the three that I'm active on are Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And at all three of them, my name is just my writing byline, all concatenated together, no spaces, no punctuation, Robert J. Sawyer. Thank you for that. We have talked about um, quite a few different topics today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to bring up at this point? Yeah, because we're in a crisis right now. You and I are having to, and everybody, are in lockdown and social distance and so forth. And the book publishing industry, and particularly the book selling industry, is a fragile entity. Find your local bookstore. I bet even if they're closed to people coming in and browsing, they're doing mail order or curbside pickup. Many, many independent bookstores are doing that across the world right now. And if they are open, go in and buy a book. doesn't have to be mine. Buy any book. Keep these cultural institutions, these, these purveyors of ideas, mirth, and uh, excitement in business. They've suffered horribly. And I, every one of us uh, who loves books should be buying as many books as they can afford in these economically difficult times from their local independent bookshop. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today, not only about the Oppenheimer alternative, but, um, you know, all of my random science questions and uh, everything else. <laughs> I really appreciate it. An absolute pleasure, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you again to Robert for joining me to talk about his novel, The Oppenheimer Alternative. If you're a fan of historical fiction, if you're a fan of science fiction, if you're a fan of books that combine the two, if you are interested in um, the Manhattan Project, I mean, there's so many reasons to check out this book. You should definitely give it a, a shot and check it out. I mean, it just came out last week, so um Put it on your to-be-read list. Check it out from your local bookstore. I mean, buy it from your local bookstore. You know what I mean. I don't mean check it out like a library. Um, but, yeah, get a copy, read it, enjoy, all that good stuff. Thank you so much, as I said, to Robert. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners. I so very much appreciate you. I hope that I don't say that too much, but I'm not going to stop because I do appreciate you. If you are a fan of this podcast and you would like to help us out, please do give us a, re a nice review, whether that's written or five star. It really helps us to get this podcast out to more people like you who love books or people who like awkward hosts who ask weird questions to authors. Um, either way, we'd love to get this podcast out to more listeners. You can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, GSMC Book Review. Interact. Uh, let me know what you think about the interviews. Let me know what you're reading. Let me know how things are going for you. All those good things. I love to hear from listeners. So hit me up on social media. As I said, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's GSMC Book Review. Hope you are having a great week so far, that um, your Monday and your Tuesday have gone well, and I hope that you have a good week left in store for you in the next few days. Please join me for the next episode of the GSMC Book Review Podcast. But in the meantime, I hope that you have plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.